four to eight parts per mil, and so it's rarely drawdown. As phytoplankton communities take up nitrate, right, they prefer N14, so you're left with enriched nitrate, N15, up in this uh, sort of category, so four to eight. And so, you know, that's exactly what we're seeing here, kind of a baseline around four and occasionally up to eight. And so the inference there is that, uh, you know, there's very strong millennial scale variations, about 1,200 years, and, and we see instances of drawdown with nearly complete nitrate depletion, you know, at a few times. And why is that? You know, what causes that? But it would have been a very different ocean at that time uh, with a lot of productivity. So that's one of the interesting things. I've done a lot of work on stable isotopes on this guy. Uh, we worked with one particular morphotype to develop this time series. And, uh, you know, it's not that easy to find forams on the continental shelf of Antarctica. Um, there's uh, very few records like this, and th this is the highest resolution. So, you know, how do we explain some of the things that we see here? There's a lot of action at the uh, deglacial time. And um, if you look at equilibrium calcite, we can make that calculation pretty easily. Most of this record uh, shows that the forams are, are growing carbonate. Uh, at equilibrium, as you would expect from modern conditions, minus 0.5 delta 18 of the water, you know, water between zero and minus two degrees centigrade. But this is different. This from, you know, 800 to 1500 years ago is, is uh, profoundly different. And so that tells us this was a time of unusual change. It increases our understanding of natural variability in this part of Antarctica. Uh, so water either a degree warmer, maybe a little bit more, or lighter, or it could be both, right? So that would argue for greater meltwater input and, um, and warmer temperatures. The other thing we can see there is this change in um, sea level as the big ice sheets melt, right? So this is a Gornet's uh, reconstruction of sea level, and a lot of people in, at different Florida institutions have worked on the history of sea level, right? That's been a, an important thing for scientists in the state of Florida. So this is the last, one of the more recent in a long line of sea level reconstructions. But here we are in the last glacial, sea level's down 120 meters or so. There's some meltwater pulse events, and we're coming up to minus 80 meters around 14,000 years. And the shaded area here shows the interval that it's covered by the sediment cores from Antarctica's continental margin. And so the oldest sediments there uh, would have formed when sea level was about 60 meters lower. And we know that seawater delta 18 decreases by about 0.11 parts per mil for every 10 meters of sea level rise. That's because the ice that's melting is contributing low O18 water to the ocean. And so uh, that, a simple model just shows that much of this decline here is simply the result of the addition of glacial meltwater during the last 60 meters of sea level rise. And, you know, I guess, I mean, in one sense you could say, oh, well, is that surprising? Honestly, it's not, but there are very, very few records that have ever demonstrated that, that have ever shown that. Um, so uh, we think that's a pretty cool result, but it also sets the baseline against which you can look at these, you know, peaks here and here. So this is really different at the beginning of the record. Um, it implies either very low delta 18 seawater, which you would get from the melting ice being proximal to where the forams are growing, or seawater temperatures that are two to three degrees warmer. And, uh, and it's between about 11.8 and 11.4 at that site. And it's followed by sudden cooling to take you up to the maximum values that we see during the whole record. So that tells us something about conditions and the speed at which ice retreats from this part of the margin. Uh, there's some Tex 86 data. This is coming from Veronica Wilmot. Um, this is exactly how she sent it to me. You know, I, I mean, I find these temperatures to be a little bit high by two degrees or so. Maybe the whole thing gets shifted down, but there's not a whole lot of action in the Holocene. Here we are, 12,000 years in modern. Not a whole lot of action in these Tex 86 temperatures, except at the very beginning where you know, she's got temperatures as high as four or five degrees centigrade there. A two to three degrees centigrade increase in temperatures similar to what we would infer from uh, oxygen isotopes. And there's, you know, we have scads of data sets for this thing now. Uh, I think this is the last one I was going to show you, but it's titanium uh, measured by X-ray fluorescence in the core 
Uh, this is done at a millimeter scale, so that's what all the red dots are. But, but there's two pulses of high titanium, one at the very beginning that corresponds to with this first mode in the ice core, and then another one centered around 4,000 years ago, this secondary mode. And that's usually interpreted as the input of terrestrial material uh, from meltwater coming off of the continent. So I guess, you know, you look at these kinds of things. I mean, there is a sense that the ice cores and sediment cores are recording millennial scales in temperature and climate, uh, you know, that are consistent over this period, which hasn't been done very much. You know, it's been hard to get the ice core community to work together with the, the marine sediment core. I'm going to finish with this one, um, one idea here about connecting the tropics to Antarctica. Um, Ding published this paper uh, on winter warming in West Antarctica caused by central tropical Pacific warming. It was an interesting paper because it suggested these atmospheric uh, mechanisms, uh, atmospheric Rossby waves. And um, one of the figures that they published is this one. They're showing uh, uh, the contours here are uh, geopotential height anomalies um, associated with one of their model modes. And then they're correlating that to uh, temperatures in this part of the Pacific, the warm pool, the beating heart of the global climate system, right? And so their paper was mainly about West Antarctica. That's where they have the largest anomaly that seems to be associated with heating. But you can't help but notice that, you know, this uh, 20 contour extends halfway around East Antarctica, including, um, you know, Totten Glacier area and where we've been working off of Wilkes Land. And so there are significant correlations then. Um, the, this is their SST in this box correlated with this uh, 200 millibar height anomaly and you know it looks pretty good it's not perfect so they tossed that out there in 2011 and then uh, Brad Lindsley had published a paper um, using foraminifera O18 and magnesium calcium uh, from the Sunda shelf area and uh, showing this kind of unusual temperature anomaly from about 10,000 to 11,500 years ago. And these are temperatures, upper ocean temperatures. So, you know, they argued that the Western warm pool really got warm and it happened fast, lasted for, you know, 1,500 years or so, and then it started cooling down again. Well, if you put those two together, right, you know, maybe it's this kind of system that's forcing rapid melting, uh, at the same time in not just West Antarctica, but also this part of East Antarctica that I've just been talking about. And um, so the observation that we're seeing amplified warming right now in the Western Pacific, right, which is, I mean, you see that in the short instrumental records, and we certainly see it in this composite of coral records. Well, you know, it doesn't bode well for the future of Antarctic ice, particularly in the areas where the ice is grounded well below sea level. Those are areas where we know the ice can respond quickly. So I'm going to stop there. Um, my intent here, I know, you know, it was like a smorgasbord, and we probably didn't go into enough detail to satisfy some of you. But my intent was just to illustrate uh, ways in which paleoclimate data can be used to help us think about uh, the climate system. Um, when I talk to senators and Congress people sometimes, about climate change, you know, I find it very useful to bring in some record. It might be an ice core record from Greenland, like, hey, you know, look at this, younger dryas. <laughs> you know, things happen really fast, and here's how we know that it happened fast. And here's the limits on our knowledge. Here's how it may or may not apply to today, but at least they understand, you know, like we have physical things that we work on, and we use techniques that are based on well-established physics that tell us things. You know, we're not making this stuff up, <laughs> right? Uh, and just introducing them to the scientific method and putting a face on it, you know, I mean, I encourage as many of you as can, go talk to Governor Scott, <laughs> go talk to your representatives. You may come away at first thinking that you didn't do any good, but collectively, you know, it can. And I mean, people are interested in this stuff too. It's crazy stuff that happened in the past. Why should we expect? the future to be any less crazy, right? So, um, you know, engage in that way as much as you can. And I'm around tomorrow. I'm happy to talk to anybody about uh, any of this stuff. But thank you very much.
okay, how deep are the corals? Um, so that one big guy, big mama, you know, she's, she's at the bottom there, 65 feet, the top is at uh, 30 feet. Um, but we have, uh, in some cases, you know, corals, many corals have depth preferences. So you can find one kind of coral at five meters and another kind at 20 meters. And we started to work with deep sea corals too that we collect with submersibles. And our depth range for those guys so far is about 200 meters down to 2,000 meters. So just, just a comment on interpreting temperature. Right now, if you go out to the warm pool and you make a measurement of sea surface temperature, um, if you get a nice freshwater lens up there, it's a diurnal change in temperature would be one to two degrees C. Yep. And so if in the past, more fresh water or less fresh water, that's going to greatly change the surface temperature. And also, while it's not readily understood, <coughs> it's actually upwelling in the warm pools. And it's upwelling owing to diversions yep. in the thermal. Uh, because the sea surface is sloping opposite to what it slopes in the eastern Pacific. And so if you change somehow the wind, and therefore change the sea surface slope, you're going to change the convergence, convergences and divergences on the equator, and therefore the temperature at those corals. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's complicated. It's super complicated, and we're a long ways from being able to say we know the integrated water column heat content <laughs> at any of these sites. Um, there, in the Lion Islands now, um, a lot of folks have been working at Christmas Island, for example, and there are, there's deep sea corals and then deep shallow corals and shallow, shallow corals, and people are starting to, you know, tell the difference. Like, is this just a change at the surface or, or did it propagate down through the upper 500 meters of the water column? Um, that's just starting to come together at a couple of sites, but I accept, you know, all of those caveats and cautionary notes. Um, you know, that American Samoan site, I mean, the other thing, you know, a number of coral records come from reef systems, you know, people like to go into the back reef because there's big bombies and you don't get as seasick because <laughs> it's not as rough, but, but we tend to beat ourselves to death on the fore reef and try to be in really exposed open water areas in part so that we think it's capturing you know, a, a, an open ocean signal. But, you know, if there's a big change in the thermocline at 50 meters, are we going to see that? Not with the shallow corals. Yeah, so, I mean, we do have, um, we took some cores from the side, you know, as well, where the growth rates go down to two to three millimeters per year instead of one to one and a half centimeters per year. And you always get really weird offsets, <laughs> uh, you know, isotopic uh, artifacts in those. Uh, Jurgen Patzel did part of his dissertation on that topic. So, yeah, we have criteria for growth rates. We do try to drill in the axes of maximum growth. A big flat coral like that one, you know, today, I mean, you can drill right in the center there and, you know, it's getting lots of light. Um, it's growing maximum in the up direction. But what about if we went back 800 years when that thing was a smaller coral? Maybe we're drilling, you know, in, into the side or maybe it's shaded by some other. There's a lot of big corals there. They call it the Valley of the Giants, right? And you can see it in America's newest national park. It's on the map, Valley of the Giants, these massive corals all around. And so they're going to self-shade each other, too. Um, but we've worked on, we've done, I've drilled at maybe 20 sites now um, and looked at that correlation. And it, as a rule of thumb, below 8 millimeters per year, you can start to get some funky isotopic artifacts. And more than 1 centimeter a year, we don't. But that's empirical. Anything else? All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we can take Excellent. off the two. Yep.